Hi everybody and welcome to the Cameo Launch Short Film Showcase. We've got a very special episode for you today. Actor, writer, producer and director Aditya Kumbar McCormack joins us to discuss his short film The German King, currently available on our brand new cinema page. This film is based on the true story of King Rudolf Duala Mangabel, ruler of Cameroon at the outbreak of World War I. Cameroon at this time is a colony of the German Empire under Kaiser Wilhelm II. Realizing Germany is subjugating and oppressing his people, King Rudolf makes the fateful decision to rebel against his colonial master and childhood friend for the good of his people. Writer, director and star Aditya Kumbo McCormack talks to us about telling this forgotten tale of resistance and the fight for freedom at one of the most pivotal moments in recent human history. We also discuss the parallels between this story and the events unfolding in our own time including the need for cultural representation, the Black Lives Matter movement, and the responsibility of using positions of prominence in the entertainment industry to correct the depictions of marginalized groups. Ada Tukumbo is originally from Sierra Leone, but now lives in the United States and has built a successful acting career, appearing in TV shows such as Lost, 24, Heroes and NCIS, and films that include Battle Los Angeles, Blood Diamond, and Captain America the Winter Soldier. Now, being of Sierra Leonean descent myself, this was a particularly special interview for me, and it provided insight, perspective, life experience, and frankly was often just a whole lot of fun. As I mentioned before, The German King is available to rent on the Cameo Launch Cinema page for £1.49, so before we jump into the interview, take a look at the trailer for this epic short film. Our enemies will try to make you forget who you are. Die beiden sind beste Freund, genauso wie du und Rudolf in diesem Alter waren. Guten Tag, Kaiserin. Ein perfekter, schwarzer deutscher Prinz. Würde das dir gefallen? Ja, Sir. I serve at the pleasure of the Kaiser. Know that everything I did, I did so that our people would be free. What's the matter, Rudolf? The Kaiser is like family. But raised us brothers to go against him. Wilhelm is not your family. Your skin will always be the color of the rich Cameroonian soil. And they will always walk over it as if they own it. Your family would rule under German protection. So why did you turn against us? Your father's new ideas of independence are a cancer. I fear have infected you too. Aber mit der Hinrichtung eines Jungen startest du einen Krieg. Wir sind schon im Krieg. They're inside the palace. Kein Krieg. Lass mich sofort frei. So, joining us on the Cameo Launch short film podcast is Aditya Kumbo McCormack, director of The German King. Aditya Kumbo, thank you so much for, for joining us today. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. No, oh, thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, it seems like you've been very, very busy. First of all, congratulations on the new series of Castlevania as well on Netflix. That's got to be exciting. Yeah, we're really excited about it. It's going to be an outstanding final season. Uh, so definitely everyone tuned in. It's going to be amazing. Fantastic. Now, definitely, uh, that's that's definitely on the radar. I think this, this it's got quite a big following already, though, right? I think that there's been quite a lot of buzz around the opening. It's what Netflix's um, highest rated animated shows. Uh, you know, our fan base is amazing. They, you know, followed us through the, the past four seasons. And um, yeah, it's just great to see how many people love the show, love my character, Isaac. And uh, yeah, it's the fans who we do this for and who keep us going. And I'm stoked for them to see what happens next. Yes, it looks fantastic. And generally, I think you, you've been keeping yourself incredibly busy. I mean, not just with this, but, you know, with the German King as well. So before we, we get too deep into it, do you want to give us a bit of a, a breakdown as to what the German King is about? Yeah, so I wrote, directed, produced and starred in The German King. Uh, it's about Rudolf Duala Manga Bell, a Cameroonian king who was raised in Germany, was very good friends with Kaiser Wilhelm II um, of Prussia. And, uh, and basically had a, a friendship and they grew up together, they were best friends. And when Rudolf's father died, he came back to Cameroon and became king. But he saw that Cameroonians were being subjugated, enslaved and just oppressed under tyrannical German colonial rule. And he decided one day that he wanted to stand up and rebel and do something about it. So he leads his nation in a rebellion against colonial rule. And that was and was instrumental in bringing down colonial, German colonial rule within Africa at the time during World War One in 1914. What surprised me is that I didn't know about this story. This is this is one of those instances where um, African history and European history connect in such a, a an explosive way, and it's it's not a very well known um, piece of history. I mean, how, how did you find out about it, and what and what compelled you to to pursue it as a as a film? 
Well, here's the thing. It wasn't taught to us in schools. I had no idea who Rudolf Dwala Mangabel was. I didn't realize mm. that we had so many heroic figures who were, you know, actively involved in World War I, who were rebelling against not just German colonial rule, but Belgian colonial rule. You know what happened in the Congo, um, you know, in the early parts of the 20th century uh, with King Leopold killing almost 10 to 20 million um, uh, Congolese people. And, you know, there was the genocide of the Naman Herero people in you know, South um, West Africa, which is now known as Namibia. And so these are things that we were not taught, uh, we, we were, it wasn't even talked about when we were younger. And when I got older, I was just frustrated with the lack of representation um, of, of Africans and just the, the way Africans and the African experience was portrayed in film and television. The images that you were seeing were overwhelmingly stereotypical. They were very negative. Uh, the characters were relegated to being sidekicks. They were not central to the plots of the, these films and TV shows. And, and I said, you know what? It's about time we took matters in our own hands. If we're African st storytellers, I think we should also be instrumental in telling the stories that we want to tell and showing the world how we want to be perceived. Uh, Chino Achebe said it best. He said, if you don't like someone else's story, you write your own. And so mm -hmm. that inspired me to say, okay, I don't like the way these stories are told. I don't like the fact that they're told from a different lens. Let's, you know, take agency and let's empower ourselves to make our own stories. And so I just started doing a lot of research and just was fascinated by all these different stories that were out there. You know, we had, you, you, you have a lot of people who, for example, the, you know, you have brave hearts, you've got your stories of these other white heroic figures. And we don't really have a lot of that. I can, probably count them on one hand, you know, you've got Shaka Zulu, you've got a couple others, but you don't really have our heroes celebrated in film in the ways that they're supposed to be. And I mm -hmm. thought, listen, it's my responsibility as a storyteller, my responsibility as an artist to make sure that these stories come to light. And in the hopes that a future generation can also see that we had our own heroes who were, you know, who we can look up to. And it wasn't just like the white people, or the, you know, the white colonialists who were heroic. It, you know, we have to rewrite our narrative, rewrite our own stories and show that we were um, agents of change. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the fact that you were able to do this it, within the confines of short film is nothing short of amazing. I mean, just by by virtue of it being truncated in, in um, duration, there's probably so much you have to leave out and so so much that you can't really explore. But at the same time, you know, you manage to communicate the the pride this this man has in his land, the conflict, the internal conflict, because he he thinks of of uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II as a as a brother. The fact that they grew up together, his own son is is um, under his care at that point as well. There are so many. Um, narrative threads and character dynamics going on in this short space of time but it doesn't at any point feel overstuffed or rushed so you know I, I don't know how you managed to, to do that <laughs> 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 but yeah I mean what, what was the what was kind of the writing process for that how, how did you manage to, to to nail the pacing and the and the key aspects well so I, I found the story a couple of years prior to putting pen to paper and it was just, I, had, I felt like I had this enormous responsibility to tell the story well, because it wasn't mm. something I'd ever seen in a film or on TV or whatever. And so, yeah, and the yeah. fact that Rudolf Duala Manga Bell's relatives, his ancestors, I mean, his offspring and the, you know, his grandchildren, great grandchildren, they're still living. And knowing that they're going to watch this film, I knew I had to do his story justice. And also for the thousands mm. and millions of people who are going to see the story, I wanted to make sure that I was telling a story that was authentic. Um, that was entertaining, but still stayed true to really what happened to Rudolf. And so I looked at the most important parts, or what I felt were the most important parts of the story, which was you know the, cup, the last couple of days leading up to his execution. And you, in those last couple of days, you really see how clear his motives were for leading his people to independence, for rebelling against colonial rule, the fact that his, um, his people, the Duala people, were being... Uh, driven from their ancestral lands, they were being told that they had to make way for Liebensraum, you know, which was living space for the Germans. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. you start seeing just how awful it was in those last few days. And it, it was tormenting for Rudolf because on the one hand, he knew he had to do this to save his people and, you know, set his people free and give them, you know, yeah, just give them freedom. But on the other hand, knowing that what he was doing was going against his friend, someone who did mm. he grew up with and going against 
how he was brought up. And I, I always compare it to how a lot of us Africans who are raised in British schools, I went to a private English school, uh, my entire family went to private English schools in, in Kenya, and how we are taught to be the perfect English people, right? But mm. in a sense, sometimes what happens is it strips you of your own cultural identity and it brainwashes right. you into thinking that you're something else and also thinking that another culture, for example, English culture, in Rudolf's case, German culture, is somehow more superior to your own. And so over these last few days, Rudolf was seeing that what, what these people were doing wasn't right and wasn't good. In fact, it was genocide. And so he was he ended up standing up for what was right. And I felt those last few days of him coming to grips with the fact that what he was trained, what he was brought up to believe was ultimately wrong and was ultimately mm. you know, there to destroy his people. It really does make you think about how many other stories, how many um, just incredible journeys, how many incredible people have just kind of faded into the midst of history because their stories weren't weren't told. I, mean, I, I fully um, understand why why you felt a, a great responsibility to, to tell this story well. And for the record, I, I believe you succeeded. Um, when you decided you were going to go ahead with this, um, how did you go about uh, as assembling the the team you would need? Because you know, obviously you've got uh, the people around um, King Rudolf. You've got uh, the Kaiser so you know you're going to have to have people from different backgrounds you're going to have to have different settings different tones all that kind of thing how, how did you go about assembling the team to to accomplish all of that yeah I, it was it was an undertaking it was basically we'd be we put as much work as you'd put in a 90 minute feature film we put all that work into a 20 minute short and uh and so it was trying to find yes assembling an amazing team and Justin mm. Janowitz, my right hand, my cinematographer, I've known him for years. He's incredibly talented. And, you know, for over the past 15 years, he and I have been talking about wanting to work together to create something special. And when this came about, he's a, a wizard when it comes to imagery and colors and mm. tones and texture. And we sat down very early on and I said, I definitely want to show that there is a difference between Germany and, and, um, and Cameroon. And I want to, you know, because in the space of 20 minutes, you don't really have that much time or you don't really get that much of an opportunity to show the major differences between these two cultures. And I said, well, how can we go about doing this? And one of the things we did was we used uh, filters. We used Cameroon had a warmer, you know, orange tone to the to the, yeah. the, the filming. And then the cap in Germany, things were blue. We had darker greens. We had darker colors, which showed that it was colder. Uh, I also wanted to celebrate the culture and the color of, of Africa. So we had Mariam Masuma, and Mariam Masuma is an incredible Sierra Leonean designer who came on board and she ended up uh, designing all of our clothes and making sure that they were authentic to that time period, authentic to those characters. And, uh, and, and she did a phenomenal job. So you see the jewelry, the clothes that um, Queen Emily's wearing they're all, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're authentically Cameroonian. We also had uh, some of the clothes I think Alexander was wearing later on. There was an authentic Cameroonian. We had, a, <laughs> we had a language coach. So we had a Douala language coach to make sure that all the languages, the, the, the Douala that we were speaking was authentic. And not only authentic right. to uh, Cameroon, but authentic to that time period in 19 that time yeah yeah because it's the language has evolved so so very much over the past 106 years so we had to make sure we had a, a coach who helped us with that we also had a german mm. uh, dialect coach because i speak four different languages over the course of that 20 minutes short wow and so we had a we, yeah, we had a german dialect coach who helped me with my german and also try to make sure it's authentic to that time period so it was just a lot of work that we put into this thing to make sure that it was authentic. Wow, that is that is amazing. That is amazing. And, you know, for something like this, you know, everybody needs to be on board and and uh, and committed to the vision, right? Because it's if the, the, the kind of work that is required, the kind of commitment that's required, you know, I think everyone needs to be fully on board with, with what you're trying to accomplish. What were some of the conversations you had, if you can talk about that, with with the crew, with the cast in terms of, why you were making this film, what you wanted people to take away from it, um, and who you wanted to see, because the the 
the assumption might be that um, you want people of African descent to see these stories, which ob ab which is absolutely very important. But but people of European descent should probably see this kind of thing as well, right? So w w were those the kinds of conversations that you had, and um, what 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 did you talk to them about when when you were getting them on board? That's a great question. So when I first started making this film, I remember I never had heroic figures to look up to when I was younger. So my main objective was to that 12 year old African boy to show him that, you know, black boys can be superheroes too. I remember after one of my one of my screenings, a, a young white kid actually came up to me. He was like, your film was my favorite. And it blew me away because that wasn't my target wow. demographic, to be perfectly honest. It was yeah. to a 12 year old me who had said, listen, I've seen Spider-Man, I've seen, uh, you know, uh, William Wallace and Braveheart, I've seen Batman, I've seen Superman, who are all these white, sometimes blonde haired, blue eyed characters but who did not look or who did not sound like us. And so it was, my target was to show and to empower young boys, but then it ended up being empowering other boys, girls, people of color, white people. It was, and what was very impactful about that is it showed people, it showed the world that there's a different way to look at black people. So yes, it mm -hmm. empowered us, don't get me wrong, for sure, but it also showed the world a different lens through which they can view us not as victims, not as slaves, not as downtrodden, not you know, as people who have flies on their faces. You know, I was very mm -hmm. um, adamant about not portraying people of color in this film in a negative way. Yes, you know, the brutality happened. I did think we need to exploit African people by showing it. Um, I, I just didn't want to show that image of, of us anymore. We've seen that, we've seen that done to death. You know, and um, death. yeah, and so, so for me, it was just about doing that and then also with the Europeans showing a different side of their history. I think in history classes, we are taught that all the great things about colonialism, because we brought a train station to Africa, we um, gave you education, we gave you schools, we gave you all these things, but they don't talk about the genocide, they don't talk about the brutality, they don't talk about the cruelty, they don't talk about, you know, the displacement of the people, they don't talk about the apartheid, they don't, talk, there's so much. And so what we're doing is saying yes, there's a part of history that we've seen and that's talked about, but there's another part of history that isn't talked about. And the way yeah. I accomplished that was also by, you know, doing a lot of research, getting dramaturgs, getting historians all on board to make sure the story that I was telling was as authentic as it can be, you know? And then, yeah. um, and then also I had a great team behind me. So Hannah Sturwald, who's an editor, she made sure that, you know, that she gave extra tones to Germany and, and cut the Cameroonian scenes in a different way. We also had sound be, you know, in, it be an important factor in this in this show. So when you see a lot of the German scenes, there's a lot of harsh, you know, mechanical tinny sounds. Whereas in in in, in Cameroon, there's a lot of warm sounds. We have we have uh, Theodore Ramirez, Theodore Ramirez, who is our um, who did our score. He also gave us beautiful drum sounds. He just made Africa come alive and made you feel that you're in Africa. Um, versus, mm. you know, just what we perceive to be the coldness of, uh, of Europe. Yeah, I mean, I think one one of the things that really make the film work, and I'm going to try and avoid spoilers for anyone who hasn't seen it, because obviously we want them to 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 watch it if they haven't uh, if, if if they see the interview first. But one of the things I think really makes the film work is the time taken to humanize everybody, just about everybody. I mean, there are people. Um, within the inner circle that have different dynamics and different plot threads and intentions going on. You have Wilhelm and his wife as well. She is trying to be his moral compass in, in this situation. And a lot of the time, if you're telling this kind of story, you wouldn't necessarily take the time to to, to highlight those those differing points of view or to, to humanize people in that way or to go into those different characteristics. Um, was it important to you to show the the deeper motivations of your antagonists as well as your protagonists? A hundred percent. You know, I think one of the things that I always talk about is like, yes, there's more that um, makes us the same, that, that separates us as human beings, right? We are more alike mm. than we are dissimilar. And I wanted to also show that, you know, when you watch the film, you see what is the driving force between Rudolf and, uh, and Wilhelm? And both of us want to make this world a better place for our ancestors, period. And, and so that's what, you know, when, when you look, and I also want to show how similar it is to what's going on today. You know, how it's like with white supremacist delusion, which is let's hold on to this concept of, of white supremacy so that our, our children, our grandchildren 
can have their own land. And and it's like, mm. no, you're holding on to something that is exclusive, that is racist, that is only going to give one set of people, you know, power over a whole other set of people who also rightly belong in this land, you know, and who've also been a part of building this country and making it what it is. And so for me, mm. it was, you know, sort of just showing, not to make excuses for Wilhelm and for um, Augusta, but showing just not make, just make the Mickey Mouse mustache twirling characters. I wanted to make them real and have their motivations for expansion, for, um, you know, basically taking over another land, just make it, you know, fully motivated. And also mm -hmm. you understand that, you know, just in the same way during the civil rights movement, there were people, there were white people who were walking the streets of people of color, who were, you know, protesting. And, and, and same with Black Lives Matter right now, people who were who are very much against oppression, who are very much against racism. And in the form of Augusta, without giving too much away, um, who is, uh, you know, the Empress, Wilhelm's wife, I wanted to show that there were people who were the moral compass, who were saying, mm -hmm. yes, this is the way you want things to be done, but also there is a better way. There's a more inclusive way. There's a way um, that is a right way, ultimately. And, and that's what I did with Augusta. And in my case, you know, and, and I also wanted to show that with my wife, Emily, she would say the same thing. She would say, yes, you know, you've been raised a certain way, you've been raised to think something, but what about your children? You know, and there's a line, mm. which is one of my favorite lines um, that Constance Ejuma, who's a phenomenal, phenomenal actress, she says, you. Um, you, you know, she, she, she says, you do this so that your children can have a land that they can call their own. And, and that till today gives me chills because that's what we're all doing here, you know? Yeah. This in, in America, in Africa, we want a land that we can be free in and a land that we can call our own. So basically, you have to take on the responsibility of guiding everybody else's performance, telling the story as director, and then on top of that, um, taking on the lead role as well and, and then nailing it. <laughs> so, Thanks. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was harder than I thought it was going to be in. Uh, you know, I think you have an idea as to how things are going to go when you're writing this script, you're meeting with your uh, cinematographer and your cast and your crew, but when you're actually on there, on set, dealing with things like actors not showing up and having to recast the same day, uh, you know, dealing with some script issues, dealing with scheduling issues, dealing, it's, there's so much that each of these jobs yeah. does. I mean, that's why you have professional producers. That's why you have a director and they all do their individual jobs. They rarely do them at the same time because it's a, it's a massive, massive undertaking. Uh, but what helped me was, I mean, I knew all my actors and we'd had many conversations months leading up to filming this. Constance Ajuma is from Cameroon. So it's, as far as authenticity goes, she would also come in and just basically tell me what she felt was authentic to the region. She is a distant descendant um, from Queen, uh, you know, a distant um, descendant of, of Queen Emily's. Uh, also, oh, wow. um, yeah, interestingly enough, and a, a few of the actors are actually German. One of them, his great grandfather, actually was Kaiser Wilhelm II's palace guard. So it was wow. we had a lot of really interesting uh, connections to the people that we were we were portraying and um but you know i i gosh i thank god every day for my director of photography uh, uh justin janowitz who i begged him to be my eyes and ears because the thing is sometimes if you keep going back after a take and you go back and you look at playback as actors you can be very self-conscious actors sometimes are like well that's not my good side and you start you know you start maybe modifying or changing your performance to make it look good because you're more concerned about aesthetics mm. rather than performance and so one of the things I told him, I said, you know, especially the more emotional takes, I'm not going to look at playback. And I'm going to need you to tell me if you feel, you know, you and I are in sync as, the kind of, as to the kind of story we want to tell, what I need for my performance. If you feel that we're not getting that, then let's do another take. And so he was great at that, you know, and he was great at, wow. at um, just pushing me, you know, in my really heavy intense scenes to make sure that I gave the best performance that I could. But by that point, I mean, I'd spent months with this character. I knew Rudolph, I felt I knew Rudolph through and through. There are also so many similarities between Rudolph and I. And so it was just really getting myself lost in that world, lost in his, um, just his mindset and, and what he was trying mm -hmm. to achieve. And, and 
and I, I'll never forget, there was a moment, I think it was during the interrogation scene towards the end, uh, as you all will see. And I remember having a really hard time with my co-star. We were just, because you're there trying to make something real, but neither of us have experienced what that was like. And he was playing the German interrogator. I was playing, you know, R Rudolph, obviously. And it was, I think after just, I said, let's just keep running it. Let's improvise. Let's get rid of the script and let's just, let's just talk. You know, man to man, let's talk about what's really going on in the scene. And we suddenly dropped in. It suddenly became real because in that moment, you realize what was happening in that time. Tens of millions of Africans were dying, literally dying mm. in the hands of German colonial rule, literally. And it just became when you started personalizing it and thinking about your own family. And, and, and you know, I have nieces and nephews. I have a, a wonderful nephew. Um, I'm staying with my sister right now during this crazy pandemic and imagining this little baby and having him be, you know, just the, the, the brutal things that were happening to children of his age and thinking mm -hmm. that I don't want that. And, and also during that time, this is before the George Floyd pro protest, but America was ready for change. You know, we were, and the world was ready for change. I think people were just like, can you not see that our black children are being slaughtered in the streets, literally, mm -hmm. you know? And, and it was just suddenly in that moment, I felt what everyone was going through. It didn't matter, you know, and, and I, everyone, my, my co-stars, his privileges as a white person, he finally could understand and see what it was that people of color were going through a hundred years ago and going through today. And that just changed everything. What, what is it that, um, that uh, uh, um, Coretta Scott King says, I think she says, I, I may be paraphrasing here. She says, freedom is not won. It's earned every generation. And in that I realized, oh, it's so true because here we are hundred years later. What, you know, so in 1914, 50 years after that, we're talking about Martin Luther King. We're talking about the civil rights movement. We thought we'd come so far. And then you have the what's right. You have Rodney King, uh, you know, now a hundred years later, we're having this issue with, you know, BLM. We're talking about white supremacist delusion. We're talking about all of these things, the same issues time and time again. And so it just made me realize once again, as, as my responsibility as a filmmaker, as an artist, that this is my way of contributing to making sure that we as people are free. It kind of makes you think about certain parts of history in alternate terms, right? Particularly when it comes to America. Because um, what might history say about George Washington had the American Revolution gone the other way? You know, if if um, the British had actually ended up winning that war, how would how would George Washington be regarded? Would his story even be told? Do you know what I mean? Um, and I think there, there are certain aspects like that, that even, you know, if you're approaching this this story as a as a white person, you can still draw those parallels. You know, and I think this is also one of the great things about short film because it's not expected to be commercial. Um, those considerations aren't there. You don't have the the age old excuse of, well, this person makes more money at the box office. We don't really have many people of that background who can really carry a movie and all that kind of stuff. You can you can do away with that. I mean, it's nonsense anyway. But you can do away with it, with any of those excuses um, when you're making a short film, and to a certain extent, it may it may allow people to be open and honest with their feelings about this particular topic, or to look into a piece of African history that they might otherwise have not engaged with. Do you think that's that's part of what happened on on this film? The history that we're given, right, is the history that we just take as fact. We take for fa mm. I, I just assumed wrongfully that our history began in 1885, which was when the Berlin Conference happened and Africa was split up and th they made these savages not savage anymore. It was, you, you don't really have our history talked about prior to that. And so what I realized mm. was, yes, you have an enormous responsibility, which is a controversial responsibility, but to rewrite a narrative that is never talked about. And so what I'm very happy about is, yes, I didn't have a lot of people saying, um, you know, it's an independent film. And for me, it was to try and tell the truth, the, the historical truth that we have not seen that has not been presented before. And, and so we were able to do that without any constraints, without people saying that, you know, I, I don't feel like you should play this character. I don't think you should do this. I don't think you should do that. We got to just tell the truth. And, um, yeah. and, and one of the things we're also hoping to do, uh, uh, we're trying to develop a feature length film, uh, a feature length version of this story 
which will then Amazing. dive in a little deeper into what happened in Cameroon in 1914, um, all the different people who were actively involved in fighting against German colonial rule, both in Cameroon, in you know Namibia, in East Africa. And these are people who are just often overlooked in history, but who are very, very heroic. And so mm. that's one of my, my goals is just to let these heroes get the recognition that they deserve and let history be rewritten to basically reflect what the truth actually was. And it's great that you're in a position to do this, but obviously that that um, didn't come about easily. You, you have a very long um, filmography um, that goes back years, and you have, have spent a long time doing a variety of different roles, um, from you know very, very, very small roles, right, supporting roles, to leading roles, and... You know what? What? What's? What have been some of the major points of, of navigating um, a career in acting, coming from Sierra Leone to the United States, and and then trying to find um, that that route for you to actually make a, a sustainable career from 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 acting. Well, yeah. First of all, I always I, I <laughs> my parents thank God for them because you know me that's alone, Bobo, and it's <laughs> which is I'm a, uh, translate I'm a Sierra Leonean boy. And uh, yeah. what I do is something that is unheard of. Uh, you know, I think Jimmy Ashere said it best in one of her um, her comic skits. She was like, if, if you're African, you're either a doctor, a lawyer, engineer, or shame to the family. <laughs> and I'm like, well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well non doctor lawyer, I'm, I'm hoping not to be ashamed to them. Um, but I, I, think I, was, I was very blessed to have my, my late mother was an actress and, and a phenomenal actress. And so I think it was already in my genes, uh, being okay. being an actor. And I think they were more willing or open to the idea of me becoming a, an actor. Unlike, you know, and, and I'm very, very blessed and very fortunate to have parents who are very, very supportive. And you know, I, I'll never forget, my dad tells me this story. I think I was nine or 10 and I think my grades were suffering or something. And I, I made good grades in school. And, um, and, and so he took me out of the school play, <laughs> you know, and, and then I was very, very upset about it. And you know, if you had a soft seat and, you know, I was just very upset and <laughs> frowning all the time. You know, I, I, I know how to be a little dramatic as, as you know, I'm an actor. And so the headmaster called my parents into school. And, you know, that's the worst thing that can happen to an African parent being called in by the, the principal. Mm -hmm. And they were like, so uh, what's going on in, in your family? We have to talk. And my parents are just mortified, first of all, that they're, you know, the principal's office. And, and they're like, why? They're like, well, your son's, your son's depressed. And, and we're trying to get to the root of what's going on. And my dad was just like, well, we just took him out of the school play. And the headmaster said, well, for God's sake, put him back in. And, um, <laughs> and like, even if he needs extra you know, tutoring or whatever, we'll make it happen. But he needs to be on stage. And my dad said from that, they put me back and my mood changed. And that's when they knew I was going to be an actor for the rest of my life. And so... Wow. Yeah, so, so I was, you know, as I live and breathe, I, it was like, I must act too. And I did my mm. first movie when I was 12 called The Great Elephant Escape with Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Julian Sands and the late Leo Burmester um, and just a tremendous cast. And I think it was the first time that well, I loved acting. I, 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 I love it so much. And, but that was the first time I realized as an African boy growing up in Africa that you could make a living as an actor. You know, this wasn't just some pipe dream. It was something that could be very much a reality and my reality. And so my parents were like, well, if you want to do this seriously, you also, you're, you're, you're Sierra Leone, you're Kina Kiyobobo, you have to um, go to school and not just any school. you got to go to the best school. you got to get a degree in it. you got to. And so, you know, I, and that's what I did. I went to SUNY Purchase and, you know, graduated with you know, Magna Cum Laude and, you know, and started. And, and, and it wasn't easy at first, to be perfectly honest. I, uh. I, I'll never forget, we have this thing called the League Cons Consortium, the Consortium of uh, Professional Theater, theater Arts um, and Training Schools, you know, so SUNY Purchase and a bunch of other top-notch programs are part of it. And I didn't get an agent, I didn't get um, a, a manager, I got nothing out of it. And, and I, I remember calling my dad and, and crying, you know, looking for sympathy. I'm like, Daddy, I didn't get anything, I didn't get representation. And then there was this like chilling silence. And then he said, you owe me $120,000 in education. <laughs> and I was like, oh, 
okay, well, because African parents are like, no, we, we've invested all, you know, under 20000 or whatever yeah. it was in, in fees. And it was like, we've invested in you. So stop feeling yeah. sorry for yourself. Yeah. Get up off your behind and don't do it. And I said, oh, it's like that. But it's true. I mean, in this industry, mm. you have to be your biggest cheerleader. You can't go to somebody else and, you know, ain't nobody going to work as hard for you as you. And so yeah. I, I went to Los Angeles and I started, book, you know, I auditioned, got myself a manager, got myself an agent, started auditioning and booking right off the bat. Um, and I would say, it's, especially in the earlier days, I, I got some, I made some really, really good relationships in Hollywood. And, and I think I'm also a really nice person. I try to be the nicest person as I can be. Because this town is small, people talk. If you're not a good person, nobody wants to work with you again. Um, mm -hmm. So I try to remember everybody's names on set. I try to hang yeah. up my wardrobe at the end of the day. So, you know, because it's like people, I've worked a 16 hour day, but these people worked a 17, 18 hour day. They're there before, yeah. wardrobe's there before I, I get there and they leave an, an hour or two after I, I, I leave. So you just mm -hmm. have to be as pleasant as you can to everybody and people take notice. And thankfully, because of my relationships with people, work begets work and they've said things like mm -hmm. i want to work with idea again you know i i go to church with polly perrett um and i i ended up working on ncis with her and she ended up coming on board right. as producer of the german king and she's such a wonderful wonderful human being and one of the nicest people i know but that came through my relationship with this woman and so um yeah i think it just helps just to be nice and it's not that difficult mm. to be nice and and being yeah. prepared yeah. as well you know it's like I work my butt off as well. You, and you have to, um, especially if you're a person of color, you have to work mm. twice as hard. Mm. You know, you just have to. That's just be the truth of the matter. And um, and so I'm, I'm prepared. I learn my lines. I, and I work hard. And, 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 that's, and that helps tremendously. So, Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think there's, there's a tendency to, um, to have a bit of a misconception about the way a an acting career is supposed to develop that you know you you start at the bottom you do the small roles and then do you know the the next one maybe you get a tv gig and then you know the big one comes along and it's not like that i mean the the thing that carries you through as you quite rightly said are the relationships and that can carry you into a smaller role in a bigger movie or a bigger role in a smaller thing or a big role in a big movie you know and it's it's not necessarily the role it's the relationships you cultivate along the way and um and you know i, I was um in fact it's a bit of an anecdote i've, I've recently been doing um uh, a rewatch of uh, of the mcu the marvel marvel movies and um a couple of weeks back i was watching um captain america winter soldier <laughs> Yeah. So I watch it, I was like, oh yeah, great movie, great movie. The credits are rolling. It's like, oh yeah, yeah. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wait a um, minute. I remember when Captain America came, I was like, well, first of all, I'll take anything <laughs> because to be in a Marvel movie, I mean, come on, that's that's amazing. Everybody wants to be in a Marvel movie. And mm -hmm. and but what also struck me was working with these megastars, uh, you know, Chris Evans and Scarlett Johansson. Mm -hmm. And these are people at the top of their game but also how incredibly nice they were how prepared yeah. they were how you know just generally good good people and i was like and they worked and also the misconception how hard they worked people they worked yeah. really really hard those movies aren't easy uh mm -hmm. i did a movie called battle los angeles about a decade ago and i and you know i think people think you know when you're an actor it's like oh you've got your trailer and everything's cool and whatever I worked harder than I've ever worked in my entire life in those five, six months that I did that movie. You know, it mm. was it was very, very strenuous. You have three weeks of boot camp prior to filming, which means that you're up at five in the morning. You have our staff sergeant or, you know, coming in. He's like, Reveille, Reveille, literally with like a pot and a spoon. And he's like banging noise. And you're like, oh. And if you're not the, if you're the last person out your bed and your bed's not made properly, he's like, drop and give, you, give me 20. And, you got to do that. And, you know, it's mm. you run two and a half mm. miles and you're doing hundreds of jumping jacks and sit up. I mean, it was so intense. And we did that for a full three weeks. Um, wow. And then right after that, we went into filming, but we didn't have a place to, we, we couldn't go back to our trailers because the trailers were so far from where set was. Yeah. So a lot of the time we had to be, um, you know, on, on a highway that they blocked out for, for a few weeks under the hot sun with a 45 pound um, bag and your weapon and your, and it was so difficult. I remember a couple of times wow. I for sure thought I was gonna pass out 
you know, but then because you are, um, the, what, what the three weeks, the reason why those three weeks were so important was so that we could learn how to convincingly be um, Marines. So that when you're mm -hmm. watching this movie, a Marine will say, oh yeah, they know how to assemble, disassemble their M4s or M16. They're actually holding their weapon the right way. They're actually clearing a room the right way. They're hugging the wall the way they're supposed to. Because we're trying to make this as authentic and as realistic as possible. And also the tiredness that we felt was genuine. We were, ex we were physically exhausted. But then you think about Marines are out there for months, you know, <laughs> under the hot yeah. sun. If, if you're in Fallujah or if you're in, um, you know, um, Afghanistan, wherever, you know, and it's just, you realize that in order to convincingly, sometimes convincingly portray these characters, you also have to somewhat experience that to show um, show the world what, what, what that's about. Um, but I digress. Uh, the, the other thing is, yeah, so I've had a lot of relationships with casting directors. So, um, you know, they see you do good, good work and you have to be prepared. You have to be, know your lines, you have to, you know, and so shows like Castlevania that I'm on right now, I'd worked with the casting director before, I worked with the studio before. And so when Blood of Zeus came up, it was um, I, a big part of why I got that job was thankfully because of my relationships with um, the studio casting and the producers. I, I think there's there's a certain amount of needing to be a, a self-starter in there as well. I mean, obviously we talked about relationships, but you know, being a person of color, being of African descent in, in America at this time, to what degree does being a self-starter drive the, the 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 need to address representation? Well, okay, so a couple of things that go in there. Um, I'm the youngest of five, and my I have four older sisters who are extraordinary. Most of them have PhDs, you know, in nutritional sciences. Uh, my sister's at chair of um, the public health department. I might be butchering it um, in um, a, a university. My other sister is a professor. They're all professors. They're very very brilliant. Super super smart. And so when you are the fifth coming, you know, sort of last in this legacy of excellence, um, you also want to strive and, 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 and do your best as well and make your mark in some way. But also what my parents and my sisters have also taught me is being in service, right? And so it's not just, you know, I, I, my sister did something for um, the Ebo when Ebola was ravaging West Africa and she was very instrumental in raising money and raising awareness and, um, and just basically helping put an end to this horrible, horrible crisis in West Africa. And one of the things that I, you know, I look at, I'm like, how do I make this world a better place? My other sister, I'll never forget, she was in Mogadishu and she took my call randomly. And I was like, and I was, it's just, I, you hear literally like explosions or something in the background. I'm like, what, oh, wow. what is going on? And she's like, oh, the UN compound's under attack. Is this important? I got to go. And I was like, what <laughs> you know like what are you wow. doing uh, you know and it was just and seeing just all these things that they are doing and realizing that it's not about us right it's about how we can make this place better as cliche as it's about how we can make this place better for other people so whenever i'm i come up with a, whenever i have an idea for a project i ask how can i serve how can i use this to serve other people and make other people's mm -hmm. lives better so it, it yes it's easy to you know when you get a role and and um, you know, I, I just got tired of the stereotypical roles, which are, you know, like hoodlum number four, whatever. And I'm like, how are black people perceived in this in this industry? We're perceived as threats. We're perceived as less than. We're perceived as three fifths of a man. And if you keep doing that, you're perpetuating this negative stereotype of black people. So I mm -hmm. said, I don't want to do this anymore. I have nephews and of color. I, I know a lot of people of color. How can I make this? How can I change? the narrative to make this a better place for them. And also, mm. how what can I do so that they can see themselves positively reflected in the media yeah. as superheroes, as empowered people, as, you know, that is my goal. That's how I can contribute. So yes, I don't have a PhD in, you know, whatever, in, in um, you know, uh, uh, political science, you know, but I use my artistry to make things, to make a change. And so I'll never forget, I had, um, I had a casting director early in my career say, you know, I, I auditioned mm -hmm. for this, sh this show and she was like, listen, you know, and I gave her a very standard American accent and, I, you know, and it was just, and she was like, no, but, you know, let me just be real with you. You know, you come into my office with your wide African nose. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, you're never going to play a doctor or lawyer. You're never going to be Denzel or uh, Blair Underwood. You'll always play someone from the hood. You'll play someone from the street. So fix the way you talk. So it goes with the way you look. And 
and I remember thinking, and she was like, she wanted me to be more like, and this is a white woman from Idaho. And she was all like throwing up gang signs, like you're from the, the, the hood, you know what I'm saying? You gotta be like, you're from the, the east side of the Bronx or whatever. And I was like, uh, offensive. But, um, you know, and I was mm. like, no, there, if I continue to do this, if I continue to perpetuate this, that's all, that's the only way people are going to see us. And so the best mm. way to, to put an end to that is to be a self-starter to take your career into your own hands and say, listen, if no one's going to give us these roles, let's create these opportunities for ourselves. So, so it's not just about me, it's about my peers who are incredibly talented and it's ultimately for the future generation as well. And it's scary. I mean, that, that you can actually, in a professional setting, you can, in a professional setting, go into an office and someone can actually say, no, you need to be more like you're from the hood. And, 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 and this honestly, happens all the time. Honestly. This is not a one-off. This happens to people all the time. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Which, which kind of brings me right back to, to why short film, basically, because this is what your fifth, sixth short film? As, as, I think as, my as fifth short film. Yeah, that's correct. Fifth short film. So embracing short film in, in the environment in which it exists, do you find that you're able to, to create stories and create perceptions in the way that is more real to you without having that person looking over your shoulder. And when you do that, are you able to draw in the kind of um, talent and the skilled people and the experienced um, sort of practitioners within the the TV and film industry and, and as actors to, to help bring those visions to life? Yes. Uh, uh, let me tell you something. I'm very, very blessed um, by the fact that everyone who's contributed to my production company, to financing my projects, they are all like-minded. They are committed to not perpetuating stereotypes. My Matt Fight, who mm. is, um, you know, I did Irish Goodbye the first uh, during the whole Syria crisis. I felt it was important um, to basically bring attention to what was going on there. And I did a short film about um, a young boy who escapes Syria and becomes a refugee in America. And once again, I was like, it's, and it's also not just about me. I can't say I'm an advocate for you know minority rights and not champion LGBTQ rights. I could not champion people who are small, not champion people who are religiously persecuted, not champion, you know, you've got to do it all. And so mm -hmm. I decided to do a movie about that and the people who helped finance that, I largely financed by myself, but the ones who also contributed to the financing of it always thought the same. And so. And my, my, my co-writer, and we can't do this by ourselves. This is the thing. Yeah. Um, I, I, I always extend you know, to, to my white counterparts and my people. I'm like, we have to do this together. It's not a black responsibility. Mm -hmm. it's, not a, it's all of us together in this to move forward. And so, um, yes, we were able to make a film. And, and, and sometimes, you know, my, my, my co-writer, who is a white, white man, he is so good at reminding myself to keep thinking outside the box because too often, mm -hmm. You know, as a product of colonialism, you start only thinking through the lens that you were raised with, you know, and so you think, oh, in, in a weird British white lens, you know, you're like, and that's how I sometimes see things. And I have to remind myself there's another way, another way to you know, view my work and to view the world that we're in that is an authentic way and that is not, that is true to these people, not true to what we think um, these, these stories are supposed to be. And so that's mm. what we are always doing. And whenever we have our meetings, we're like, is this authentic to what we perceive these, these um, you know, stories to be? Or is this what is actually, you know, happening on the ground with these people? And so we do a tremendous amount of work. We are always interviewing people from that. You know, I remember when we did Irish Goodbye, we were talking to Syrians like you'll never believe, understanding right. that getting coaches who spoke Syrian Arabic versus Egyptian Arabic. You know, um, so just trying to make things authentic to that region. And then now as we move forward, you know, as with my business, trying to employ people from those regions to continue to have people of color tell their own stories and, and make them as authentic and as accurate as possible. And, and um, you're now moving into, as you said before, um, developing The German King into a feature film. So are a lot of the same people coming back? Are you, do you have that kind of grand swell of support to, to, to push it into feature film territory that you had for the, for the short film? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's so interesting how, you know, I, I remember when I, was, when I first wrote it, my plan was always to make a feature length film, but it's a huge budget. We're talking about a World War I film and also changing the narrative. So, you know, it's like, Every world, you know, you look at 1917, it, the budgets are humongous. 
And, um, but so far it's been incredible to see how many people from black, white, you name it, who are like, oh, this is incredible. Let's, let's get this made. We can't wait to see, you know, just a, a, a story that we've never seen from a perspective that we've never seen. So yeah, I'm, I'm bringing along uh, um, a lot of the people who are in the German King short are also gonna come back and do the feature. And, um, and then we're gonna get other people who just wanna get involved and see, you know, just see people of color just doing their thing, you know? And, uh, and I'm, I'm so stoked, stay tuned. There's gonna be some, you know, information coming about it shortly. So yeah, it's gonna be exciting. Fantastic, uh, we, we cannot wait to see it. And I, I could stay and talk to you about this all day, but I do eventually have to let you get back to your life. <laughs> it's my well, pleasure uh, it's good, but thank you so so much for, for taking the time to do this it's been a wonderful conversation and uh, we can't wait to see uh, what comes next thank you very much and uh, make sure to tune in May or sorry uh, May 13th Castlevania season 4 the fourth and final season uh, will premiere on Netflix so yeah tune in tune in absolutely don't miss it guys thank you so much All right, thank you that was Aditya Kumbo McCormack, writer, producer, director and star of The German King. We hope you enjoyed the interview and our thanks go out once again to Aditya Kumbo for taking the time out to talk to us about this powerful short film. Well, that's it for this episode. Please don't forget to subscribe to the podcast by heading to cameolaunch.com forward slash podcast, where you can follow our show on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music and Spotify, among many others. You can also find this and other episodes on our YouTube channel, so head over there and subscribe. Don't forget to hit the bell so you get notifications of all new video releases. As always, we remain open for business at our online shop. This online retail commitment to classic cinema includes box sets from legendary filmmakers like Jean-Luc Godard, Akira Kurosawa, and Werner Herzog. Head on over to cameolaunch.com forward slash shop and pick up a little something for the film lover in your life. Please stay up to date on all things Cameo Launch by making sure you follow us on the socials at Cameo Launch on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also go to our site, cameolaunch.com, and sign up to our newsletter so you can stay up to date on everything we've got going on. Once again, thank you for being with us today. Go and check out The German King for £1.49 over at cameolaunch.com forward slash cinema. You can also find Time Travel Adventure Caper Recursion also available for £1.49. Check out the link in the description to watch both of these fantastic films. Thank you once again for joining us. You all stay safe, and we'll see you next time.